I'm Georgia Maria Gilkey Blanchard, but you can call me Rhea. Um, can I tell you about my 1906 honeymoon on this beautiful ship, the Bangalore? I think she's more like a yacht than a cargo ship, but there she is in New York Harbor being towed out to sea, ready for a voyage. My husband, Banning, that's Phineas Banning Blanchard, and I corresponded for years. Uh, he was seven years older than I was. Uh, and we, we saw each other when he was home on visits. He had been a captain at 20, uh, but he wrote to me while he was out on the, the Herbert Black and the Willard Mudget. And once during our courtship, Blanchard took me sleigh riding and the, the sleigh overturned. We went that corner a little too fast. And one of my, one of the little ladies in town said, oh, that surely means that he's gonna marry you, that you're gonna be engaged. <laughs> so on one of Blanchard's flying trips home, um, from California to Searsport around the Horn, he stopped uh, and proposed to me, and a week later we were married. Uh, my family had just moved, and so everything was in disarray. Um, so there was no time to prepare. And I wore my graduation dress from two years earlier. I don't think I'm gonna fit in that any... Now, oh, we wore corsets back then. Uh, my waist is never gonna be that small again. But it looks, it's a nice graduation dress and a wedding dress too, so I think it's fine. Um, after a buffet lunch, Blanchard and I took the train to Philadelphia to embark on a year-long voyage around Cape Horn and then back. And Banny had her fitted out with the usual provisions, but then he, he packed me some candy and nuts and fruit just for me to make it nice. And Banny decided to teach me navigation and the stars and brought me a sextant so that I could take the sights and chart the course every day. And so he got me charts and we got books on astronomy to um, chart the celestial bodies. And so every day we'd go out and take the sights. And once on the way, it all seemed like old times. You see, I had grown up at sea with my father and mother and sister and brothers. This is a turtle my father got from the Piranha River down in South America. So we had many adventures growing up. And Blanchard, like I said, had been uh, grown up at sea and had been a captain by 20. So we were old hats at sea. I spent most of my youth, uh, so, so, sorry. so, the ship was very comfortable. There was a large after house with a sitting room and a dining room. The sitting room had a rug on the floor and a built-in couch on each side with red cushions on one side and green on the other. You know, port and starboard. <laughs> uh, there were four easy chairs screwed to the floor because the ship is rocking and rolling and so anything screwed down would move. The captain's room had a built-in double berth, so we could sleep together. There was a couch built under the porthole. And off the captain's room was a bathroom with a tub and a toilet. And the toilet had two arms beside it, so that when it was really wavy out there, there was something to hold on to. Ah, food. The food was amazing. So at 7.30 every morning, we had cereal, or cornbread, or muffins tea and coffee. And on Sundays, we had salt, mackerel, and hot biscuits. Dinner was at 11.30 a.m. with beans or pea soup, boiled salt beef, potatoes, vegetables, and pie or pudding. On weekdays, the pudding was plain duff. If you put raisins in it on Sunday, it was plum duff. Mm. There was a hard sauce made of sugar and butter. Oh, it's amazing. No wonder I don't fit into my dress anymore. Supper was cold sliced beef or hash, fried potatoes, gingerbread, or cooked prunes with tea and coffee. 
when we could at four o'clock every day, I would make hot chocolate for Blanchard and I. And every few days, I would make candy on a small oil stove. And if it was really wavy, I'd hold the stove between my legs. But luckily, I never burned myself. But it wasn't all pleasant. During one storm, the four topsail yard came down, crash. And the next day, a big sea came over the quarter, which burst forward, parted the coach house, broke down the door, and washed the two binnacles away. A compass was lost, and the man at the wheel was hurt. Some water came in the cabin. It was such a mess, but the cat just walked around like nothing had happened. Banning was exhausted, and the wind finally let up. A few days later, the crew refused to obey an order because given by the mate. A fight broke out among the men, and all were so tired that everyone joined in the fight. Banning told me to stay down below, lock the door, and he took two belaying pins, gave one to the bosun, and one into the fray. And the fight was over pretty soon afterwards. That's my Blanchard was just so, my Banning is just so strong and handsome. <sighs> he still is. So on the trip, we set sail from Philadelphia, carrying coal to San Francisco. Then we went in ballast to Honolulu, to, uh, to Hawaii, took on sugar and sailed to Lewis, Delaware. When the trip was over, I went home to my parents here in Searsport. And a couple of months later, little Georgia Maria Blanchard was born. And when she was four months old, we went to California where Blanchard was working and retired there for five years. And what a year's voyage we had. Thank you for coming to see me. The bark Emily, Captain Small commanding, encountered a terrific hurricane. The vessel was thrown on its beam ends, the masts and deck were torn out, and the captain and seven of the crew washed overboard and drowned. The first mate and three of the crew were on the wreck for five days without food when they were washed ashore on Stewart's Island. They wandered a week with little to eat. They were discovered by a party of bird hunters who rescued them. Hello, are you visiting in Searsport today? It's a lovely night. Oh, I'm Lucy Edwards. Um, I have a millinery shop right down there, right down in the corner, and I'm heading up here to the, to the town hall. I have some business to do. Before I go home. Um, I, I came, I was born in Brooks and I've lived in Searsport for a really long time. And during the time I've lived here, I came here first because Brooks is a very little town and I'm a milliner and so I make hats. And I really needed to have a place where there were lots of ladies and the sea captains, wives and daughters like nice things. So I came here and I've been very successful. Um, and I first came very, I was born in 1843. And I, when I first came here, I was a young woman at the very beginning of the Civil War. And at that time, um, Mr. William Merrithew asked me if I would have um, a telegraph instrument installed in my, in my shop. So I had to learn Morse code and then I had to, um, then I got the news of the war every day. And in the afternoon, I went and stood outside the door of my shop and told everybody what was happening for the war. It was pretty, there were lots of Searsport boys um, fighting. So it was a very good thing that I could do um, for the town. Um, I, I've lived here, as I said, I've lived here a while and I've been pretty successful. Um, right when I first came, I lived in a hotel when I ran my shop, but then I managed to buy a house and I bought a house down there on Water Street. So when I leave the town hall, I'm going to be heading home back to Water Street to where I, to where I live. And also just, although not to bribe, I also have five shares in the Belfast Savings Bank. So I have done very well. And one of the things that you'll notice is that we're in this village and that the people, lots of people who've lived here are still around. Um, if you, up there in the brick house, um, Captain Merrithew does, he's gone, but his family still lives there, his second wife and, and their daughters um, and granddaughters, and they like hats. 
So, you know, you always like a family that has lots of ladies um, because they'll buy, they'll buy lots of hats from you. And in this house, this is uh, the, the, uh, the Fowlers had gone by the time I came. Mrs. Fowler died just before I came to see this court. But there's a scandal involved in this house. And, um, but the family still lives here. The, it's amazing how long these houses stay in the same families, the people still live here. But um, I probably should get on my way up to the town hall, and I'm sure you uh, want to take a look to the village, because it's a very, it's a lovely place to visit. Um, and I hope you enjoy your visit, and I'll be on my way now. Thank you. Captain Curtis sailed the bark Salomon Piper through the Straits of Le Maire in 1847, bound for California. A bold navigator and very religious, he would record in his log after taking a daring chance, by the grace of God, we came through. He left Searsport March 20th, 1850, and went to California in 148 days seeking gold. Good afternoon. My name is Captain Goodall, Daniel Smith Goodall Jr. My father always said if a name was worth using once, it was worth using twice. Now I'd like to tell you about two incidents in my life, one of which I'm fairly proud of and one of which I'm rather ashamed of. Now the first one was in the 1876, I was commanding the ship Brown Brothers and we were around in Cape Horn and I was aft by the wheel and I heard a cry from up forward and I looked up just in time to see one of my hands lose his grip on the foyard and fall into the sea. Well, as quick as I could, I tied the mizzen sheet around my waist, dove in and sw struck out for him and was able to grab him by his hair. Uh, not the best place to grab him perhaps, but I um, thought better get what I can rather than miss a chance. And they did call him Baldy after that for some reason, but I got him back on board and Massachusetts Humane Society give me a medal for it, gold medal for life saving. And that's the one I'm proud of. Now, the other one, that happened in 1890. And that year I was commanding the ship Charger. And again, we we're heading for Valparaiso. And we departed out of Boston. And at that point, steamers had taken up a lot of the trade and good hands were getting harder to, harder to find for sailing ships. And uh, I didn't like to do it, but I was forced to resort to a crimp. That's someone who uh, provides sailors for ships. And I'm ashamed to say not always willing. And he promised me a lot of prime seamen, and well, they were prime, but not seamen, uh, prime something. In any regards, there was one fella, a real hard case, James Dooley, and he were not, he were a sailor, but he was not a good one. And it got to the point where he was talking back and raising trouble and refusing to do his work. And I told him, well, I lost my temper is what I did. You should always keep control of your temper. And I told him if he didn't do his work that I'd flog him. Well, he didn't do his work and captain's got to stand by his word. And it's hard enough to control a crew when they think you're a hard case and you, they show a sign of weakness, then they'll, uh, anyway. The upshot was that, well, I flogged him and I felt bad about it. And when we got to Rio de Janeiro, I discharged him. And when I got back to Boston, you know what I found? I found that man and a sheriff waiting for me. And uh, they took me for the judge, accused me of flogging him, which I couldn't deny. The judge was kind enough to let me plead nolo contendere, which is Latin for I do not contest it, which means that I didn't plead guilty, wasn't found guilty, but I had to suffer the punishment just the same. The punishment was a fine of $350 which could have been much worse, although it was a lot of money, uh, better than losing my license. And uh, I think the judge took into consideration the fact that I had saved a man before and the medal and all that. So I don't know if one counteracts the other, but that's the two things that happened to me. In loving memory of Purr, was drowned in the Indian Ocean July 4th, 1872, in her first year of living. Loving cat of Joanna Falk.
You may have seen my second ship I commanded, a painting of the A.J. Fuller under full sail, hanging in the Penobscot Marine Museum, or that of my portrait, which is also there. These are pictures from the end of the great age of sail and the beginning of the new age of steam and mechanics. That is, from a time like yours of massive change, upheaval, confusion, innovation, and rebirthing. I was a master and captain of both these grand vessel styles, adapting, embracing, fostering, and respectfully living into the novelty and progression of ocean transport a sea. Ahoy there! I've stopped by to tell you this astonishing story of enacted providence and seamanship from my logs of the A.J. Fuller of these two Atlantic Transit collided. We were rushing westward under full sail, flying light as and its sailors say, all, with only ballast along the shipping lanes from Liverpool, England, running before favorable winds, but with dirty autumn weather, storm-ridden weather, toward New York Harbor to load a full cargo bound for San Francisco, earnestly awaiting us there. On an early pre-dawn watch in October of 1889, positioned abreast the banks of Newfoundland, our crew spotted a strange light with golden reflections on the western horizon ahead about three points off our weather bow. I was called to the deck. I immediately determined it must be another ship in severe distress with fire aboard. As it lit up the heavens like an island burning somewhere below the horizon. These were the warm tones of smoke and flame reflected brightly in the low hanging overcast sky. I ordered the ship to haul up close to the wind as possible, trim the yards carefully and found that I could just fetch that eerie light and jam her hard to the course towards this must be disaster and provide aid. Then it began to breeze up in little gusts, and the delayed southeaster, I realized, was rapping at our door. The sky sails were already furled, but the royals I should have taken in, but I did not. I kept them set and let her go. She was a smart vessel, and on the wind, she had the more sail that she carried. She was better, and she liked it and the higher she would point. She heeled a little harder, and we felt the breezes and the squalls, gave a lift and a hunge into the darkness, and then found her pace, settled into it, and headed toward that lurid glow in the western sky. Within an hour, we were able to make out the tops of flame above the horizon. And within three, we were close to weather, reached a steamship, engulfed in flame and fire, looking like an enormous torch dropped into the black and angry ocean. Solid flames mounted hundreds of feet in the air, illuminating a wide arc over the western horizon. Long before we reached her, our decks and sails were painted with a hideous red. No one could be aboard her alive, but fortunately four lifeboats were holding close and relying on her conflagration and column of fire to be their distress beacon to craft within 50 miles. We hove to, keeping our main yard back, and we let them row to us. Well, they came in one by one, dragged under our lee, and the men in the main channels passed the bow and the stern lines to each one, and then others were able to push off with boat hooks and keep them safe. 
and the other crew was able to skiff, skillfully assist 59 survivors aboard without endangering our ship or crew. It turns out this was the British flagship steamship Santiago bound for Hull, England. We carried them all back to New York Harbor with us and it was our duty and our delight that we should save these people and return them safely to port. And we still arrived ahead of our owner's schedule. In the thanksgiving of their safety and rescue, they presented me with a gold chronometer watch and my wife with a pair of gold bracelets. You can read about this in Logan, Lincoln Colcord's dramatic rendition of this adventure, Rescue at Sea, in his collected short stories titled Under Sail, as he describes in great detail the naval maneuvers that we utilized to overcome the dangerous conditions that we faced. I'm Abby Clifford, and so is she. The ship, I mean. My husband, he named it after me. The Abby Clifford. He's dead now. So am I, of course. <coughs> Only he died first. Died of yellow fever out on the sea. So did half the crew. I was the only one left on board who knew how to sail the thing. I always had a fascination for navigation, and, well, <clears throat> I've been feeling better, so up I got from my sick bed and did it. <clears throat> lived, too, all the way to New York. Outlived even my second husband. Of course, I died one day, and we all have to die one day. But, you know, so long as we can prevent dying for a little while, whether it be ours or others, you know, well, I, I say we should. Now, now go on, shoot. I, I've got a ghost ship to navigate. Good evening, earthbound souls. I am Bertie Colcord, or should I say, I was Bertie Colcord. I've long since passed to the other side, or what you mortals might call a ghost or spirit. I lived a long time ago, long before there were computers or satellites or cell phones. So I suppose you're wondering why I'm here tonight of all nights. Well, I'll tell you. Every 50 years, all spirits are required for one night and one night only to return to the town of their birth and tell the most important story of their life. And tonight, that very... Where you're standing right now is where I used to play hide and seek with my friends over a hundred years ago. So, are you ready for my story? Good. The year was 1891. I was 11 years old. My father, John Colcord, was the captain of a merchant ship called the Elizabeth. It sailed from New York City to San Francisco all the way around South America. The trip lasted over 100 days. I was on board too with my mother and my sister. It was a splendid passage with no rough weather until that day. It was the last day of the voyage and the last day of my father's life. As we sailed past San Francisco, I could see the Golden Gate and all those beautiful houses on the hillsides. The weather was glorious that morning. So we passed on a tugboat and continued sailing to Bonita Point. But then the weather turned badly. About one o'clock that afternoon, the wind picked up greatly and the seas got very rough, tossing the ship around like a rag doll. Then suddenly I remember seeing it coming right at me, the biggest wave I ever saw. It threw me and my father off the top cabin and onto the main deck. I was nearly knocked overboard. I was never so scared, but my father and three sailors pulled me back up onto the ship, but the waves just kept pounding and pounding. Four tugboats came out, but their lines couldn't hold us. The ship was taking on water and seeking fast. Like I said, I was scared. Somehow I managed to find my mother 
and sister. My father put us in a lifeboat and lowered us into the water. As we rowed away, I heard a sound that I'll never forget. Crack! I turned around and saw the masts of the Elizabeth splitting in half, like they were toothpicks. The last thing I remember was my father shouting orders from the bow before the ship disappeared into the sea. When it was all over, 18 sailors perished, including my father. My father, the bravest man I ever knew, did everything he could do to save the ship and everyone on board. But even the bravest of men are no match for an angry sea. The only survivors that day were three crew members, my sister, my mother, and myself. I would grow up, get married, and have 10 children and 18 grandchildren. One of my grandchildren is named Bill, and he lives right here in the mid coast. If you happen to run into him, tell him you saw his grandfather, Brody, who wishes him well. They say he looks a lot like me when I was older, even though we're not the same person. After all, he's alive and I'm a ghost. So that's my story, folks. Remember the Elizabeth and all those haughty seamen who died that day, including the most courageous man I ever met, John Herbert Colcord, my father. Goodbye for now, and I'll see you right back here again in 50 years. Remember me, remember me. Brig B.K. Eaton, taken by the rebels and burned while under Captain Nichols' command. He was confined in three Confederate prisons for more than eight months and finally exchanged for Confederate prisoners. Captain Nichols disappeared from ship Resolute on voyage from Cardiff, Wales to Valparaiso, Chile, October 1881. Well, welcome folks to the Jeremiah Marathew House. And be careful how you step because that sidewalk down there belongs to me. Uh, I'm not terribly fond of it. The church up the street there, the uh, congregational church, kept building its own sidewalks and I kept tearing them up. Uh, I, had, uh, I, was, I had come to Searsport in 1806 I built my shipyard that away down down b below Elm Street and eventually got married to the love of my life Jane Cluley in 1816 in excuse me 1821 um, we later built this house in 1826 and I had started up a brickyard up in Swanville and used uh, oxen driven uh, wagons to bring the bricks down here to build the house. I had offered the bricks to the congregational church, but they being uh, opposed to that decided to build the wooden church that you see there today. And I can't say as I was all that fond of them subsequent to that. Uh, I had spent quite a good deal of my life at uh, building ships and also then skippering them taking trips to Boston and New York and places beyond. Um, I bought the house across the street and fixed it up for our daughter Lucy and uh, nothing is too good for her. I converted it to that modern style. They call it Italianate. Uh, but I was in the end a little disappointed because I did so much to create Searsport and then that guy from uh, Boston, David Sears, donated a couple of bucks to them, and they decided to name it Searsport. So I've not been entirely happy with that. I also founded the Searsport Bank on the second floor of the Merrithew block, and I'm still president. I even served in the state legislature. Um, so if you can do anything to help me get that sidewalk torn up, which has offended me since the middle 1800s, I would appreciate your help. Thank you so much and enjoy whatever visits you have left. <laughs> 
one has to experience the rough and heavy weather we had last week to appreciate the wonderful beauties of a night like this at sea. The moon as clear as you can imagine, each star seems to try and outdo its neighbor in brilliancy, a fresh warm wind filling every inch of canvas. The glorious silver pathway made by the moon running and sparkling from the horizon to the phosphorus wake of the ship, together with the easy roll makes a sight and sensation not easily forgotten. The schooner Almond Bird was built in Belfast and sailed out of Rockland. I will read excerpts from the Republican Journal from January of 1882. The schooner Almond Bird shipped a sea in a storm Sunday night, which smashed her hatches and sank her. The crew of eight men took to the boat. They had no water, no extra clothing could be procured, and not even an oar was to be had. There was no time to be lost, and the boat was hurriedly pushed off amid a roaring tempest and a seething sea. She drifted about without oar or sail. They huddled together for shelter while the icy spray fell over them, chilling the very marrow in their bones. They had no means of telling whether they were drifting toward land or out to sea. They and their frail craft were tossed about like a cork all day Monday, and then the darkness set in. The moon was obscured by the drifting clouds and the heavy snowstorm, and no man in the boat expected to see the sun rise again. Tuesday morning found them still alive but suffering terribly from the cold, and the terrible picture of death by starvation and thirst rose to their minds. During the afternoon they saw a sail and made frantic efforts to attract the attention of those on board, but they failed, and they saw the unknown vessel pass out of sight below the horizon. Another night of horror and darkness closed in on them, and hunger, cold, and exhaustion were fast taking away all hope. Wednesday morning found all hands alive but suffering terribly. Two men were delirious. In the wildness of their frenzy, they tossed themselves from side to side, while the chattering of their teeth and their insane mutterings foretold the speedy termination of their sufferings. On Wednesday evening, the first death occurred. One of the delirious men became furious for a short time, then coiled himself up at the bottom of the boat and died. Two more men passed away during the night, and when Thursday morning dawned, the boat, laden heavily with ice, contained five men in the agonies of despair and three dead bodies. There was not a sail in sight, nothing but a vast expanse of sea and sky. The pangs of hunger and thirst and the terrible exposure to cold were unsettling in the minds of the survivors. There were no provisions of any sort, and furtive glances were cast at the bodies of the dead companions. A hasty consultation was held, and it was decided to open the veins in the neck of one of these. The red stream flowed freely at the touch of the knife, and the parched throats and frozen lips of the crew were moistened by the still warm blood. They decided to keep the dead bodies in the boat more from selfish motives than from any consideration for their late comrades. 
at eight o'clock a sail was seen and to their great joy it was coming in their direction desperate efforts were made to attract attention and this is the result of their success when captain saunders saw the ghastly crew he was struck with horror their faces were purple their lips and hands stained with blood and their throats so parched that hardly a sound could be emitted. They were almost delirious and so debilitated by exposure that he was afraid they would die before reaching Pigeon Cove, 30 miles away. He brought them in safely, however, and two surgeons were summoned who bestowed that care that was needed.